Welcome to the Jarek Report, my chance to show off the talents of some of my colleagues at Fox 29. We're dedicating the whole half hour to the world of art. First up, Aloysius McElwain. With spray cans in hand, this man gets to travel the world painting portraits of beautiful women. Rough job. There's this aspect to like when you're trying to create art, um, where you're trying to also kind of figure out why this is appealing to you and why you want to try to recreate it so much. You can find them in uh, Japan, right outside of Tokyo, Paris. I have uh, several, I have several in Paris. I did one in London and somebody already tagged over. I did one in uh, Costa Rica. I did one in uh, Casablanca, Morocco. I've done a Eartha Kitt piece. I did Billie Holiday. I even did a uh, Betsy Ross piece. <laughs> so. A lot of times I can't see until I step back. This part looks like her so far, so just gotta tighten it up. Ooh, look at that nose highlight. Putting in work. <laughs> Five years ago, I decided that I was gonna do um, an entire series focused on uh, painting women. I'm almost there in the face. I just gotta really uh, get the eyes in a minute. The eyes, get the eyes. That's, that's the thing. A lot of times it's like, if you don't get the eyes right, nothing else works. What inspired you to start doing these paintings, man, of women? It was always one of those things with me, man, like uh, when I look at uh, nature and all the different beauty and stuff there, you have beautiful trees, beautiful flowers, birds, animals, but there's, there's nothing that like betrays emotion like human women, you know what I mean? Like you, you get, um, you know, longing, lust, uh, pain, strength, you know what I mean? Perseverance, you get all those looks from, from you know, just a subtle like switch of the face. I'm gonna outline the whole thing first as soon as I find my cap and then I'm gonna start doing fillings. So I had some of it done, but. You talk a little bit earlier about growing up around strong women. That's 100% one of the reasons why I was even uh, looking in the direction to do music was well, because like I've always been surrounded by uh, beautiful, uh, strong women, you know, beautiful, strong, intelligent women. So, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why it appeals to me to try to capture that on uh, in canvas and on, on walls. Of all the women you paint, mm -hmm. the one that stands out to you the most? That's not even a hard question for me because I know what my answer has to be or else I'm going to get murdered. So I'm, I'm going to have to say my sister. So <laughs> Regardless of anything else, that's what I have to say. My sister's my best friend. You know, um, so I, I have to say her. Um, I did a piece for her, um, of her, for Bella Magazine not too long ago, and I'm really, really proud of that piece. You got this book coming out. Yes, yeah, so uh, the book is uh, Muses Volume 1. I'm so proud of it. It's collecting five years worth of uh, Muse paintings, so it's gonna um, have images of not only the murals that I painted, but the, uh, the canvas paintings, digital paintings and sketches, photography, uh, stuff from my clothing line, Culture's Clothing, um, stickers that I put up of women all around the world. And my, uh, my favorite section of the book is actually a section um, called Muses with Murals, where it's literally just an entire section featuring uh, women in front of my murals, just like enjoying and taking it in. And the really cool thing about it is that um, probably 50% of the people I know and the other 50% I don't know. So it's just like random people who have to happen to come across my artwork and love it and take a picture in front of it. So that's so gratifying for me as an artist because, you know, sometimes when you're doing art, it's like I'm putting a piece of me out there. You know, I really hope people appreciate it. You know, I have a lot of uh, really, you know, intelligent, strong, passionate, like driven women in my life. And a lot of times, you know, I just like to surprise them and just show them how much I appreciate them and do something like this, this mural that I have behind me. You know what I mean? If I can, if I can get these, uh, this shading inside of the, the irises right, this looks just like her. in the mural you did today. Oh, this is Nyla. She's gonna flip out when she sees this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's gonna flip out. That's what's up, man. It's a beautiful piece, oh, man. Thank Your you. work is always, like I said, man, I'm always so impressed. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. And, 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 and I'm always appreciative of the fact that you're willing to let me come around and watch it happen, man. You know what uh, I'm saying? Yeah, man, I enjoy the company. <laughs> <laughs> up next on the Jerick Report, you'll meet Nicole Donnelly. She says she can turn this into art.
Welcome back to the Jarek Report. Uh, now there's art all around us. You're about to meet an artist by the name of Nicole Donnelly. And she tells me she can make art out of this. Producer Mike Greenwich has her story. You know, I'm always fascinated about where people's brains go. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, how does your brain get to this? It's such a good question that I don't know. Um, <laughs> It's so interesting to kind of look at this, uh, you know, 2,000 plus year history of paper and paper making. The Chinese Empire, the Han Dynasty, and the introduction of paper as the primary substrate. Paper was this incredible technology and it was so highly valued. Such a closely guarded secret that China managed to keep that technology under wraps for over 700 years. When it hits Egypt, technology of paper making hits Egypt and Egypt has been supplying the world with papyrus, which is similar to paper, but it's not exactly the same. Paper collapses the papyrus economy. Egypt tanks because of this. It's fascinating stuff. What is the Paper Think Tank? Paper Think Tank is a hand paper making studio, community accessible, that I founded in Philadelphia. There was nowhere that you could go to sort of show up, make the paper that you wanted, or have someone assist you in making the paper that you wanted. This pulp is actually super fine, so I'm going to sort of pour it onto here and then massage it through. I'm gonna pick up this whole thing and then kind of just gets laid into here. This is a dry sheet of paper with that image already on it. And then this is the sculpture. Paper, as we know, is a ubiquitous material now. We think of it as being something that's highly disposable, but it is also a wonderful artistic medium. I'll often work in a series, so um, this sculpture here and these four pieces here are all using the same base paper, which is a high shrinkage flax, and the same color palette and some of the same imagery throughout. What I learned over time was that imagery could be embedded directly into the surface of paper. So you can pigment pulp and use it like a paint over the surface of wet paper. When it's all pressed together, it becomes one single sheet. And then you can take those prints, those paintings, and work with them sculpturally. Even your joint, so this right here right. is handmade paper. That's right. Wrapped around to almost act like glue. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, so there is a little bit of glue that's used to keep it in place while it's drying. Otherwise, it might pop off. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, the only ingredients in this sculpture are handmade paper and these invasive vines. All of my sculptures use invasive plants in their construction. Invasive plants tend to be aggressive growers that regenerate very quickly, so I can take those out of abandoned lots or clear certain areas in an environmental center and get the plants that are kind of harmful crowding out natives take them, make paper with them, but also uh, there is the woody core at the center. Paper is not made from wood, but the wood acts as a fantastic armature for the sculptures. The paper is actually made from this very fine material that you see here that's really hairy. Like these almost look like leaves, but they're made out of paper. Yes, yeah. Got you. Yeah. And they're made out of the paper, fr the, the fiber from the vine. Yeah. Is this all the same uh, world? Some, sometimes, I, sometimes it is all the same plant being recombined back together. Uh, this does use a couple of other fibers okay. to extend it. The, all the science and all the technology that goes into something that's so simple that we take advantage of every single day. Right. You know, we crumple it up, we throw it away. We, you know, we don't even think about yes. how much paper affects our lives, but if it was gone tomorrow. It would make a huge difference. and. It's such a powerful way to communicate. It's a powerful way to learn. And one of my you know, major passions is to sort of 
uh, revive paper as a very important, valuable material. It's not meant to be disposable. Coming up next on the Jarek Report, meet artist Joshua Moonshine. This guy likes to work fast, very fast. I'm moving like nature, because I am nature. Welcome back to the Jarek Report. Our next artist is Joshua Moonshine. He likes to work fast, very fast. And he likes to shake things up, like paint. His canvas, the streets. Pollock said one time, when they asked him about his drip paintings, he said, well, I'm moving like nature, because I am nature. My name uh, is Joshua Moonshine. Um, I'm from here, Philadelphia. Uh, I was born in the Northeast, uh, and I was really uh, interested in uh, urban art, uh, graffiti art, different types of forms of art that uh, the public can be a part of. The wind blows and all the yellow goes away. But because the rhythm changed, now I'm already working on orange. Too late for the yellow, it's not gonna work. Nature said no, this particular paint wants more orange. So um, this is also why I, I think I'm, I'm in the state of, of trying to find the moment. And I'm uh, using art to find the moment. Yeah, that's my little tool. Yeah, everybody has their own. Even though they're going by very fast, I'm changing very fast. The world is changing very fast. So it's a reflection of that. They're each piece like really unique. Capturing a moment. This is uh, something the machines cannot do. Sure, AI can make a great painting, but it's kind of boring to watch a printer print. Uh, when you see an artist paint, there is a magic there that, that no AI or machine will ever be able to do. So they're very, very important with, for society. The masters are great, we learn from them, but there's ma more masters being born. And if, if there isn't a street like Paris had, we, where is the new Monet? Where is the new um, Picasso? Well, he needs a place to paint. I appreciate it, man. Coming up next on the Jarek Report, art gone public, just for you. You know, little, little children walk by that each day. If it's a successful piece of public art, they're gonna grow up that, with that piece of art. It might make their day every time they see it. Welcome back to the Jarek Report. USA Today named Philadelphia the fifth best city for public art. I mean, we have over 4,000 murals in this city. So producer Mike Greenwich went out and talked to a lot of different artists who have decided to go public. So when we look at the city of Philadelphia, where there's so much public art, the fact that the city is seen as the fifth best city to experience I would say public. first. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like who's, who's in front of us? Public art serves uh, two purposes. One is to engage and beautify the community. Really great public art, like, can talk about historical figures or historical points in time. If it's public art, it, you shouldn't differentiate aid it from the graffiti artist. What we do is public art. Nothing is better than a show of pride and self-belief that when you turn this corner, you see a painting larger than life that goes up and it's a reflection of the people and the history that you embody. But two, it's also to showcase the artists. You know, a lot of public art that comes about is it's artists breaking new techniques and trying new things. 
What's this artist's name again? Sarah? Sarah Cabbage. And she's an environmental artist. And what that means is that she works with materials that are from nature. So here I'm sitting on a bench that she created from an invasive reed species called the Phragmites. When we think of public art, we need to be challenging ourselves as to what is that and really trying not to stay in a box. Public art could be building a community garden. As climate change is becoming a bigger issue that's elevated in the press and in the media, everyone is starting to take notice. It's hotter and we need to do something about it. But will a mural be the thing that helps us get there? I think a garden might be a better solution. We do performances sometimes where I've literally dressed up as a servant or a butler you go out to the hood and you advocate for, for picking for, for, for trash and pollution. I do this event once a month. Um, it's an art activation. Let's talk about the juxtaposition, right? So you, you got a bunch of writers out here doing graffiti, graffiti all over the walls, but we got goats out here, we got little kids running around. I'll invite the goats out because that's like, who the hell brings goats to a graffiti event? Nobody. So to me, that's like an icebreaker. The whole idea about it is to basically teach the community about the graffiti culture and the hip hop culture. Philadelphia is the mural city capital of the world. We have over 4,000 murals in this city. And that's not counting the graffiti murals. The team and I have used the park to build community through art, music, and sustainability. These are three subjects that no matter what race, what demographic, what you identified as, what language you speak, you're, you're gonna fall somewhere within these three subjects. You know, little, little children walk by that each day. If it's a successful piece of public art, they're gonna grow up that, with that piece of art. It might make their day every time they see it. You know what I mean? And they're gonna have that in their mind as something that is an embodiment of their community and their culture when they pass it every day. Somewhere along the line, there was a group of people that decided that art and culture is meant to be an institution, an institutional force that is then divided in terms of access and class. You know, so a lot of times when you go to a museum, the people that go to a museum isn't the full representation of the city. And not all aspects of the city feel comfortable in the museum. How do you feel that the, the city benefits from having art in public spaces where people can access it at no charge or just, you know, as they move through life? No, it definitely adds a lot of value to the city as well because it creates this outdoor museum. I think it means that what we're doing is working, it's engaging, it's forcing people to discover and interact. Some of the best and most urgent narratives that need to be shown and personified to the public at large, a la public art, are born in these communities that don't have access to the institutions. You know, so how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, cut those angles a little bit? You make the art out in the open, in the public, and make it accessible to anybody who can. Well, that's this edition of the Jarek Report. If you have ideas, hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at MikeFox29. And I'll see you next time on Good Day Philadelphia.